What happens when the world gets turned on its head? We're forced to look inward, perhaps become fearful, sometimes lash out at others. While there are others in the world who don't give up hope because they believe in people. Join me, Kevin Tibbles and Amy Goldberg for our new podcast, Believe in People, where we meet those who don't give up hope. Today, we're going to take you on a musical journey around the world, a child's journey, a journey for change. Our guest is Jake Groshon with the Playing for Change Foundation, which helps children come together and grow through music. Uh, Jake, welcome to Believe in People. The easiest question I ask you is, why does music make a difference? Well, thank you for having me. It's it's an honor to be here. And, uh, you know, music makes a difference because it's our only universal language. It's the only thing that everyone in the whole world can speak and communicate with together. And it's also something that helps us identify with who we are in a way that nothing else can. Um, it's why we use music as the key to help kids rise up to their own culture because when you're able to identify with who you are in that way through art and dance and, and, and the sounds of where you come from, it creates a different level of um, understanding of who you are, why you are, and what's possible for you. Your self-esteem rises, your abilities rise. And it's not, it's not that, that music is some magical cure, but it is a gateway to allow us to expand in every part of our lives. And we see it time and time again in every one of our programs around the world. And Jake, music obviously influenced your life. I mean, you ran a theater company Mm -hmm. for eight years. How did you Mm -hmm. segue into into not-for-profit? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I I did. I came from the theater world, but I actually grew up with my, my parents met at the Eastman School of Music and my my mom and dad are oboe and flute players and uh, I grew up going to classical music concerts and I was an oboe player myself and actually went to school on an oboe scholarship originally. So I had quite a a background in music and uh, was also a music major in college where I I learned uh, a whole bunch of different instruments and it really was a centerpiece in my life. Now I discovered musical theater at the same time and that took over my life for many, many years, but um, it's always been something that's really vital to what I do and, and has really, um, has really informed every part of my life since I was very young. Tell us a little bit about your organization. What's it called and how many countries can you find it in now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's called the Playing for Change Foundation. And we're currently in 16 countries. We have over 50 locations in those 16 countries. And uh, that's throughout South America, North America, Africa, and Asia right now. And we keep, we're at this rate adding two to three programs a year. We've been around for about 20 years, but we're in a real growth period right now. Um, the, the need and the excitement for our work has really hit a tipping point. And uh, it, it's been an incredible last few years. Um, and just this last year, we opened in Costa Rica, Panama, and Uganda. So it, it and those are all just absolutely spectacular locations. And why do you think that growth spurt happened? It, did anything have to do with the pandemic? Or I mean, I, what do you think? Well, uh, part of it is I was hired to head the organization about uh, three and a half years ago. And um, I've been really fortunate to, to help turn it into something that is not only sustainable, but uh, has developed some incredible partners from, you know, the United Nations. We do a lot of work in the United Nations, a lot of work with the Gates Foundation. Um, we've really just, just grown to a point where we have major partners around the world that are seeing the value in it and, and supporting us in significant ways. And you have also uh, worked with a number of artists. Can you just share those uh, mm-hmm. with us uh, with regards to the group? Yeah, there's actually hundreds of artists that, that we work, hundreds of major artists that we work with. I'm very fortunate. And um, there's another side of our organization that creates uh, these viral videos in which we have major artists appearing alongside street musicians around the world. And those have about 2 billion views at this point. Um, and that's really where our organization started from. But we've partnered with artists from 
Bono and Pharrell and Peter Gabriel and Andy Lennox and Ringo Starr, um, down to you know street musicians you've never heard of in in countries that you've never been to, and we put them together on, on songs or on projects, and uh, it's incredible how how much everyone just wants to be seen as a musician, no matter how famous they are. What really matters is being able to play and and be seen uh, for their art. Wow, and Jake, wow, that's impressive. And how does that work? So. You have, do you physically build and go in and help to build a facility so it's, uh, and then it's self-sufficient? And how does that right. roll out? So e each program we have is built from the ground up. You know, each one is completely individual and designed for the community that it's in. So, for example, we just, we just built a new program in Uganda. It's in the Bidi Bidi refugee camp. And it's for South Sudanese refugees in northern Uganda. And there's about 300,000 uh, refugees there. And 80% of the camp is under 18. So it's an extremely young population. And what we do is, in that case, we find a local nonprofit who's operating um, and doing some programs on the ground. And we worked with them to develop a program, identify a location for the program, and then eventually help create a massive facility there that, that starts construction this month. Um, and that's going to serve, you know, hundreds and eventually thousands and thousands of, of South Sudanese refugees. And we've already seen the input of that program. I was actually just there a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the talent level and the commitment of those kids, you've seen them go from being quite lethargic and having nothing to do to being incredibly committed to music as, as their future, as the gateway to their education, to what they want to be as they grow up. They, they wrote us songs while we were there about um that you know some of them want to be doctors some of them want to be teachers whatever they are but that they're using music as the pathway to get there um you know another example is in um mali where we've been for geez 15 years now or so that's one of our first programs and uh when we started there the community when, when you turn 15 in in mall you have to take a test right and it, it tells you if you can actually go on to the next level of education and where we are in a in um in outside of bamako we have a school that that community was passing that test about six percent when we started and we they took the test last year and over 95 percent of the community passed the test Wow, um, and is able to continue on with their education. So that the only difference between that time period is that our school came in and started working with the kids. Um, another great example: I was just so, in Nepal a few months ago, and and there we had a we we opened a a program in a village where girls weren't allowed to go to school if they're on their period. Women were barely outside of their home. You know, they they were pretty shut in. It was a very male driven society. And since the 10 years since we opened that program, we now have a community where women are equal in leadership. They're um, not only on the town council, they're now touring around the entire region, teaching other villages that women have power. And they're using theater and music and dance to communicate those messages. And it's called, we have this group called the Mother Society, and they're, they're affecting thousands. What they're doing is educating against sex trafficking. Because that's the biggest issue they face. And we always focus on how to use our education music to fix the, the major social issues that any community is facing. There it's sex trafficking. Our program in Brazil, it's you know the, 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 gang, the gang violence. In Mexico, it's the drug trade. Whatever it is, wherever we are, we're helping to solve the issues for these kids so they can continue on and have a really successful life. But one of the things when I was in Nepal that was most exciting was I got to participate in a menstruation workshop for, for the girls there. We got to learn how to use a reusable pad and, and, and how to you know, continue on with their life and not have to be shut in their home when they're on their period. But the cool thing there is that half the class that was learning about this was boys. And that's not something you'd even see in the United States. So you had this village that went from a place where they couldn't even have girls outside of the home to where now boys are learning about you know, what a period is and that it's an acceptable thing and that Girls are allowed to be participating in regular society. Um, and and those, are the, those are the kind of changes we see on a regular basis where we, all we did was insert this program and we hire everyone locally and we have every administrator and teacher um, and students come from, from the local community. 
And they grow into these places that are really educational utopias where this, this is an example of what can happen when we actually invest in culture. And I think that's what makes us quite unique in our work. So it's not just about music per se, but what you're saying to us is that the music allows you to grow culturally, which I'm assuming allows you to go grow in terms of your own self-confidence and your own stature. But then you're also suggesting that the music provides some form of empowerment to the people there. And is that is that related to the culture that all of a sudden your culture in yeah. your small part of the world is, is, is something that you can now look towards as something to be proud of? It's exactly right. It's exactly right. I think one of the issues that communities outside of you know, what we consider first world countries face is this feeling of being lesser than. And by finding pride in who you are in your own culture, by being empowered with the beauty of it and the intelligence of it, and understanding that you have a future as bright as anyone else in the world, there's nothing else like it to, to level the educational playing field that we have around the world. And I can imagine, Jake, that there's uh, quite a bit of red tape when you go to various countries. Uh, how do you navigate that whole world? I mean, does it take years to build something or is it baby steps? What, what happens there? You know, it really depends on the program. I try never to open a program that doesn't have multiple local partners involved because they help us to navigate those in each country. But I've opened some programs within, you know, two to three months and some within four to five years. It really just depends on uh, how difficult those roadblocks are. Is there a facility in place? Have we identified who the administrators and teachers of the program will be? Is the student population identified and ready to get to work? I think that, you know, our, our focus is really on, we don't have a cookie cutter way of doing this, that we have to build each one from the ground up from the very beginning, because otherwise we start, we start to cut corners and, and we don't identify that we're doing this within the individual culture and in, in their way of doing things and not ours. And that's always our focus. We're never trying to institute an American ideology on any of these places. It's that we're using their ideology to define their program and how it's going to work. I was just going to ask whether or not you ran across any suspicion uh, within local communities and governments as a result of uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah, constantly, actually, especially when we get started. Um, and that's where having the local people and partners at identified are invaluable because there's no way we could come into these places and try to open a, a school uh, without having the trust of, of local leaders and communities. So we have certainly run into some situations that are extremely difficult around, you know, governments and militias and, and um, different individuals trying to sabotage our work. And, you know, there's issues around security and, and, you know, with all the issues that the communities are facing that we have to deal with as well. But the reality is when you have people within the community helping you problem solve them and you trust those people, you can overcome any hurdle. And, Jake, and they trust so you? Well, I think that trust takes time to build, but fortunately we have a track yeah. record now of success that allows us to come in and at least say, look, we've done this before. Here's the proof of it. Here's a dozen videos showing you our work. Here's, you know, other administrators in other countries that you can talk to about the success we've had together. And then over time we build that trust to where we're not concerned about them operating correctly. We just want to support them in their work. Right, actually. So I was going to ask you from a sustainability standpoint, like how does the funding model work? So Jake, you receive X number of dollars from do donations, probably private yeah. donations. And how does that look? And what, where does the funds, where do they go? So each program has a, has, has a different, you know, uh, cost model behind it because different countries and, and, and some places we have, you know, free facilities we can use and others we've had to build facilities. Uh, so it really varies, but generally we develop our annual budget each year for each program individually. We work with them to identify the needs and the expansion that they're going to have within the year. And then we throw as many fundraisers as we can. We do as many appeals as we can, work with major artists. Um, we have a, a shirt coming out next month that Shepard Ferry designed in his Obey line that's benefiting us. 
um, you know, we try to find really creative ways to to raise funds and and uh, not not necessarily operate like any nonprofit, but to find our own way of doing things that fit within our model of using music uh, as the key to every part of what we do. I am noticing that there is a, uh, at least in the shot that I can see, there's a guitar right next to you on the table. Uh, you've you've already told us that you were a bit of a musician when it comes to the oboe mm -hmm. and that you grew up with music. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd be interested in knowing what do you get from music? What do you get out of it? How does it make you feel? Uh, you know, yeah, I, I would say that when I'm having... A, a tough day, which, you know, in this work can happen quite regularly. There's a lot of frustrations and roadblocks you run into. Um, music is the thing that centers me the most. It's the thing that allows me to understand that, you know, and, and part of it is sort of looking at it from a grand scale, which, which I like to do it, it, is that, you know, we're this, we're this floating rock among trillions of stars and it, like, let's, let's get some context perspective here. We have a chance to actually help people. And when I, when I get to listen to music and play music, it uh, it helps me to to relate back to that that all of the issues that I'm facing are solvable, and I think that's that's what we try to instill in our program is that you know if you if you start to use music as the key, all the issues we're facing, we can find solutions to. We can find a future. And Jake, how does that? Uh, how do you get your instruments? Like, what is it? Are they donated? What mm -hmm. and what do you find people tend to play more of or not? I mean, how do you sort of start that the musical journey piece of it? Yeah, so um, we let the, the, the program guide us in terms of what they want instrument-wise, what they want to teach. We always start with local instruments. So in Nepal, we teach the harmonium. You know, in, in Brazil, we're teaching traditional drums. In, in uh, Ghana, we teach the talking drum. It, it, it all, that's where we start, is with the traditional instruments and what they learn. But they always generally ask for two things, which is they want to learn piano and they want to learn guitar. Um, so wow. we do have partnerships with, with certain, um, uh, brand makers that, that give us those, we, we partner with Gibson, we partner with Roland, Behringer, Audio Technica. We do get a lot of equipment, but we have, we have to purchase about half of it overall each year, um, which we obviously do from, through donation. Um, but it does vary per program. We don't have a set instrument that we give them. The one thing we do for every program is provide them with a recording studio. And that's really important that we make sure every studio has proper recording equipment and would they have proper video equipment as well so they can film and create create videos out, out of their songs but um we also then connect all of our programs to each other around the world so kids can write songs together you might start you know a, a drum track in rwanda and then you'll add vocals in thailand and then bangladesh will pick up a bass line and we're actually creating songs all around the world where these kids can understand that while they may have never left their five block radius of their community, there's a huge world out there that they're a part of. So it is kind of like we are the world, except it really is we are the world. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it is. Yeah, that's a great inspiration. <laughs> if you are a person mm -hmm. living in poverty where you may have a difficult time, either your mother and father may not be working, you may not have active education. How can meet you up? So I think that's where we get the most inspiration, right? Where, you know, and, and when we visit these communities, we see a lot, like we have so much more to learn from these areas of the world than they could ever learn from us. We're just giving them resources. The only thing that, that changes is that we're giving them the technology or tools that they're lacking, right? But there's no reason that, that these kids shouldn't have the same access to everything that we have. The way that music lifts them up is they speak the same language. There's no difference between us when it comes to those sorts of things. We all understand what music is. We can hear a song that, 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 that you know we don't know where we do know it doesn't matter but we can listen to that song and understand it and understand what it's saying um even if we don't know the language i mean that's what's so incredible about music is we all speak this and it's the thing that connects everyone and and there's no community we go into where we say we want to help you write through music where they have questions because in the areas of the world that we work in music is a part of life it's part of their heritage you know they earned that 
And we just help make sure the next generation has the tools to continue on those traditions. And I, and I guess too, Jake, from that next generation standpoint, do you find people contributing back? So they take the programs and I imagine, uh, you know, the length of time they take, it could be anywhere from what, you know, a year or more. Uh, you'll ex- yeah, share can, that with yeah. us, but yeah. What does that look like? So the kids who, who participate, you know, the, the success rate they have in school and going on to careers is uh, about three times as high as those who don't participate generally um, in their communities. So you're, you're seeing a massive increase in success uh, just by engaging in their cultural heritage. And um, I think we've seen entire, what, what happens with every single program is the entire community starts to own it and, and take it as theirs. And that also brings with the increased local government funding, you know, national government funding for each of these programs to where over time, you know, we're obviously involved in them forever. We make sure they have everything they need. We help them, you know, t- and guide them at where we can. But the reality is these, these become owned by the community. And, and the more that we can step away from them, the more that they start to be funded and supported by others, that's, that's our success, right? We, we would love to be able to to just hand these off and say, the community owns this now, the kids are in a place where they get to advance for the rest of their lives because they're able to identify with who they are and learn through who they are. Isn't it funny how, you know, here I am talking to you uh, about this program, and yet what we're talking about really are communities that have communicated with one another, either vocally or through music, and um, it is kind of uh, conceited in a way for someone like myself to think, oh, well, we're going to go and show how to communicate through music. When the bottom line here is, is that they've probably got a heck of a lot more to teach us than we can teach them yes. about this sort of tradition. I mean, where do you think we got Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I wish more people understood that, that we have so much to like. And when you listen to the, the musical traditions of these places, like I can't tell you how brilliant the music is that comes out of these areas of the world that we just never get to hear. And it is absolutely conceded us, and, I, and I'm certainly guilty of that before I, I, before I started working here, that they have this thousands and thousands of year old traditions in these areas of the world that are extraordinary. And they have their own way of communicating and own languages and own musical languages that we can begin to understand. And the more that we can sit back and support them in, in rising up through those, the better off we all are, because then we also get to participate and learn from them. And, and it's an incredible thing where you can start to, you, not only, you love who you are and where you come from, but then you start appreciating all the other cultures of the world and learning from them and it helps shape you again to who you are and where you want to go. And it's something that, that, I certainly get to reap the rewards of on a regular basis because I'm, I'm very lucky to be able to, to work in the position that I do. And then when you think, Jake, you know, you're sharing your story. How do you share that story to funders so that they understand that you're providing access to already talented and enriched people that have this skill? So the thing is, the, the, the problem that's happened in each of the communities we work in is that these skills are starting to get lost. And, and part of that's just, I mean, most of it is because of poverty, right? Because of the lack of tools and resources where they need to focus on, you know, food and water and survival a lot more than they do on, you know, the next drum they're going to have. And unfortunately, they're correlated, right? Where actually having that drum leads to everything else as well. But if, if you're so focused on, you know, just trying to have clothing on your back, it's a, it's a lot harder to focus on your future long-term. So what we look at is, okay, we as, as this group here have the ability to, to provide them with tools that will lead them to help start focusing on their long-term futures rather than today. And obviously, we have to deal with all of the issues that come with that from teen pregnancy to child labor to whatever it might be. We're constantly facing those issues and figuring out solutions to them, but we're working with the community to solve those solutions. And if I, I think, you know, the real lesson for me is we should never assume that we have the answer for anyone. And I never mm-hmm. go to anyone and say, here's how we're going to do it. 
all I do is ask them, what do you need to thrive? What's missing? How do we get you to a sustainable way where you're leading this, where we're not supporting you forever, where you know that over time, this is something that is going to lead to futures where everyone is supporting themselves. How do we get to that point? And we work backwards and, and figure it out. And it sounds like we all benefit as a result of that. You know, Jake, every week we ask this question to the, uh, the, the person who has come on to, uh, to share their stories with us. And that is that you have been to many places in the world. You've probably seen incredible, incredible positivity, but you have also seen probably a lot of, of the nasty things that take place in our world. And our question to you is, after all of that, why do you still believe in people? You know, the reason I believe in people is that that's a very easy answer for me because of the work I do. I get to see that we are all basically good. You know, we're born good. No one is born evil. And I see that because every one of the kids that we get to work with around the world, up to thousands and thousands of kids, when they get an instrument in their hands and they start playing, there's a level of joy there, a level of positivity that, you know, even in America, I don't think we ever really get to see. There's, there's a pureness in, in that understanding that you have power as a person, that you can create something good for the world, that you are not alone, that you come from something and somewhere that matters. If, if we were able to give that experience to every kid as they're growing up, uh, all, all of the terrible things I've seen, I, I think the vast majority of those go away. And that all the terrible things come from a place where they weren't given opportunity, where they weren't allowed to have the education they deserve. They weren't allowed to know who they are in the right way. And it's our job to ensure that moving forward, this next generation does. Wow. Thanks, Jake. Thank you so much for your time. And playingforchange.org is a, is a website that everyone will be going to and checking out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that was one of the most inspiring conversations that I've had in some time. And, you know, I'd be interested in knowing, Amy, whether or not uh, putting a instrument in a young person's hand and that someday they won't pick, pick up a weapon like a gun in the future. Wow, that's a, that's powerful, Kevin. And in fact, that's so true because you're uh, building someone's self-esteem and, and empowering them to, to see what's possible. And I think, yeah, I think it does prevent people from wanting to do harm and then focus on the, uh, on the good aspects of life, you know, wherever they are. Well, thanks for we joining have, us, that's everybody. Plate. Absolutely. That's playingforchange.org. And if you like this episode, please check us out in, on Believe in People on our uh, YouTube channel and everywhere else. Thank you so much.